My name's James, and, uh, and I'm excited to preach today. We're going to have fun. Uh, my wife is wonderful. I love you, Kate. You're an anointed woman. Uh, good. So we are, we are in uh, the middle of a series <laughs> that's going to last two weeks, uh, last week and today. And uh, I'm talking about the idea, uh, I'm talking around the idea of finances, giving, stewardship in church. And uh, I just need to kind of make this disclaimer that, you know, we once a year will talk about this in detail in our sermons. Uh, you would have just seen how Kate did the offering before. We kind of just let you know uh, where you could, you know, put your cash or scan the QR code. That's kind of all the time we take in, in speaking about our offering weekly. And a lot of people have asked us, well, why do you do that? You don't even pass the buckets. And the reason is because uh, one of like the top three statistical responses to why don't you want to go to church from people is, I don't want to go to church because all they do is talk about money and all they want is your money. And so I heard the cries of the people. And I wanted to make sure that as a church that wasn't the perception we gave out because that's absolutely not true. Uh, and so we just decided we're going to give an opportunity for people to give. And once a year, we're going to go into what the Bible says about it, because I do believe that we should give to God. I'm not going to be talking in depth about tithing and 10% and all that kind of stuff. I've preached on that before. You can get on YouTube and have a look on that. But last week, we started off talking about this idea of stewardship, that we aren't the owners, but we're the managers. And if you are uh, a manager, it means that you treat it differently than if you're an owner. I don't own my money. God owns my money. And wherever my money and my treasure is going to be there, my heart is also going to follow. And so if I want God to have my heart, then God must have my wallet and my finances. And we talked about last week how we got to stop praying dumb prayers. A dumb prayer is, God, give me more money. Not a good prayer to pray. A great prayer to pray is, God, help me steward the money that you've put in my hand right now and help me grow it, so give me wisdom to see this grow. And we talked about how stewardship is this principle that whatever you steward well, whether it's money, your relationships, your marriage, your children, your studies, your businesses, investment, whatever it is, if you steward it well, you will attract more. So today I want to continue and I want to talk today about one of the values of our church. We've got five main values of our church. The presence of God, prayer, people, creativity. And I want to talk about the fifth one today. It's generosity. Everyone say generosity. generosity. Uh, this is going to be one of the easiest sermons I get to preach because this is already landing on good soil because we have a generous, 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 generous church. Look at your neighbor and say, I think you're generous. I don't know if they are or not, but we're going to prophesy over them. Now look at the neighbor on the other side and say, I know you're generous. So there's this little story in the book of Mark that I like, and I want to start here today and draw from it and then go to another passage in the Bible. But it's Mark chapter 12, verse 41. It's a beautiful little story. It says this, and Jesus sat down opposite the treasury. And he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Could you imagine how intimidating that is? Like you're just sitting there and Jesus, son of God, is just watching how much you put it in. I know if that was happening right now, you'd be like, oh, oh I'll, I'll just give a little bit more. I'll just give, you know, you feel the pressure. But they, a lot of them didn't realize who he was at the time. Many rich people, it says, put in large sums. And then a poor widow came and she put in two small copper corns which make a penny. And he, Jesus, called his disciples to him and he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance or their excess, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. Isn't that a beautiful story of generosity? This woman gave everything that she has. And I think from this story and from the example of Jesus in his life, a simple definition that I have for true generosity, deep generosity is this. True generosity is not giving from your abundance, but it's giving from a place of sacrifice. So I wanna have a look at what it means to be generous today. 
I want to take inspiration from this widow and this story that so impacted Jesus that we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. Here's my first thought today if you're taking notes is this. Generosity gives from the heart, not excess. So the main point that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples in this moment is this. He's trying to teach them the difference between giving from the heart and giving from the excess. So first, let me be really clear. A gift is a gift. I just want to make that clear. A gift is a gift. There is a level of generosity whenever you give a gift. It is a gift and, and it's generous to a certain degree. It's a gift. So if I have two t-shirts and I see you and you have no shirt, and I take my extra t-shirt that I'm not using and I give it to you, I'm generous, but I'm giving out of my abundance. I'm giving from my excess. True sacrificial generosity is I have one shirt, you have no shirt. I've been working out at the gym. So I'm going to bless the world and take off my shirt because you haven't been working out of the gym, and we're gonna help cover it up. Come on, that is a sacrificial generosity. And Jesus is using this example of this widow, and she's contrasting it between these wealthy people. This widow gave everything she had. These wealthy people just gave some of what they had. And obviously, if you know the Bible, this is just a foreshadowing of the price that Jesus paid when he sacrificed not just some of his life, not just some of his time, but Jesus sacrificed his body, his whole life for you and me. When it comes to Jesus, it's not just about little bits. It's all in when it comes to Jesus. He gave us the most generous gift of all. Not the clothes on your back, not the food in your belly, but he gave us forgiveness. He gave us eternal life. He gave us grace. He gave us mercy. Jesus didn't just preach it. He walked it. He lived it. And so he has authority to speak into this. And he shows us this difference of generosity, that true generosity, it costs you something. It's got to cost you something. You would have seen Legacy Offering is coming up. In November, I'm really excited about it. And we have this little line that we always say around Legacy Offering time, and, it, and it's simply this. Give in such a way that it costs you something. Like so many times when we come to church, all, all we do is we just, we tip God, Right? Now, I know you, we all know what tipping is, but let's just spell it out for people that aren't aware. Tipping is usually the leftover change from the meal that you paid for. So you got a few pesos left, you know, you got your little coins left, or maybe a 50 peso or 100, and, and you, you leave it in there. And, and it's what's left over. I paid my bill. This is a change. It's what's left over, so I'm, I'm going to give it. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of us give to God. We kind of just tip God the leftover. We, we tip God the, the excess of what we have. But Jesus is sitting here, and he's going, hey, look at this girl. This girl gave everything she had, more than all the generous sums. And could you imagine, just get the picture with me. Imagine this picture. Jesus knew that the wealthy were giving large sums because they would have coins in a bag. And they would have a looser bag so that when they threw their offering in, you could hear the coins rattle. And so he knew there was wealth going in. Everyone knew there was wealth going in. But Jesus calls and says, see that, see that little old widow? She gave more than everybody combined. Why? Because it was a sacrificial gift of generosity. It wasn't just the little bit extra that she had. Can I tell you, generosity starts at 11%. Your tithe comes up to 10. Generosity starts at 11. And that's when it really kicks in. And I really want to thank you, church. I can't believe that I'm about to share what I'm going to share with you again. It just feels like almost a joke at this point. But your generosity over and above your tithes. God's doing really good things in our church. Uh, for the third week in a row, I have to give a building fund update for the third week in a row. Uh, let's, let's put up where we're at this week. For the third week in a row...
in the last month, in the last month, we've received more in our building fund in the last month than we had for the entire two years that it's been open in the last month. And listen, listen, let me just side. I just got to tell you a little story because if you love this house, it's going to put faith in you. Kate and I and some of our team just got back from a conference these last few days. It was with my sister and brother-in-law in Malaysia. Beautiful conference. They're going to be coming preaching next year at our conference here. It's going to be exciting. So we were there and there was a woman there. She was preaching. Uh, her name is Prophet Cindy Jacobs. And some of you may know who she is. Some of you don't know who she is. Some of you are like, what? A woman can be a prophet, but I thought women can't preach. Well, you're probably in the wrong church. And so... So Cindy Jacobs is world-renowned. She's actually done, uh, 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 about 30 people have sent me her prophecy over Mindanao that she did years ago. And so she preached the whole time. And I was sitting there like a good little Christian boy going, God, please pick me out of the crowd. God, 5,000 people here, pick me out. Let her do a prophecy over our church. I'm believing for a building. God, whatever. And, and she preached and she did nothing. She did nothing. She walked straight by me. I'm, I'm wearing like a bright t-shirt. I dyed my hair just so I could get her attention, right? And, and I got nothing. And right at the end, uh, she was actually leaving. She, she's leaving. She preached. She's leaving the conference. And I went into uh, this little lounge and, and I was just introduced to her really quickly, really quickly. And, and uh, they introduced, this is uh, James, uh, this is Cindy. I'm like, hello, uh, yes, ma'am, it's so nice to meet you. She's like, oh, where are you from? She's from Texas. Like, where are you from, sweetheart? And I said, uh, I, said oh, I, I live in the Philippines. And oh, in the Philippines, do you know uh, Eddie Villanueva? I said, no, I know his son, I, you know, but he's very good. Jesus is Lord. And uh, and she goes, oh, I preach for Brother Eddie. I go, he's incredible, great church, so amazing. And so I'm sitting, and in my heart, I'm going, come on, give me the word of God. I don't need to get to know you. I, I can look up your Wikipedia. I, we don't need to get to know each other. You're a prophet, do your thing, right? And anyway, she's like, well, that's sweet. You know, I'm like, yes, ma'am, it's lovely to meet you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, well thank, nice to meet you. Turn around. A little bit of disappointment, I'm not going to lie. A little bit of disappointment. Anyway, so I walk around the table. I'm standing next to my sister. And so she's leaving the room to, to catch her car to go out. She turns around and she says, bye, bye, bye. And she looks at me and she said, God's going to give you land for your church. Now, let me teach you a lesson on how to deal with prophets. I've been around a lot of prophets for a long time. And one of the things that annoys me about some of these prophets is the vagueness in the prophecies. If you're going to give me a prophecy, you better be exact on what you're saying. So I look back at her, Cindy Jacobs, I look back at her, I said, how expensive is the land? Because I don't want just a little piece of land. Come on. There's a piece of land for 11 billion pesos that I'm after. And she looked at me with piercing eyes and she pointed back at me. She said, it's crazy expensive but God's gonna provide crazy money for it to happen. And I went, I receive it. She goes, and she turned and walked out. I'm like, well, I'm good. <laughs> I wanna challenge us. Hey, could we give into our building fund a little bit maybe? And I, I, We'll never crack the whip, I'll never do that. But God's obviously doing something in the last month God is stirring something, and the prophet spoke, I'm going to hold on to that word. I am believing for that word that God is going to do something so incredible in this church. It has to be. But, but, but there's a key in how we give, ready? Because if you give true generosity and it's from your heart, then you got to have the right heart to give. It leads me to my second point. This word, the apostle Paul comes in, and it's simply this. You got to have a cheerful heart when you give. I want to read uh, essentially a whole chapter that explains this so well. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and it's in chapter 9. We get this very famous chapter on giving, but I need to give you context just so that you understand uh, who he's writing to and why he's writing to them. In Jerusalem at the time, the Christians were historians believing, uh, believe facing great persecution they were going through economic hardships and, and financial troubles. And so there was a great need within the Jerusalem church. And at Corinth at the time, Corinth was a very wealthy city. It was this cosmopolitan hub of the Roman Empire. And, and it was located right 
on a major trade route. And so as a result, a lot of theologians believe that the church in Corinth was actually very financially blessed and very wealthy. And they had a lot of resources that Paul even calls out. You got more resources than some of the churches in Macedonia. And so that sets up the context for what we're about to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. It says this, I really don't need to write to you about the ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help. And I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Can I just cut for a moment? Do you realize that your faith and your enthusiasm to be generous actually begins to stir up generosity in other people? Do you realize that when you start doing little things like paying for dinners for other people, it begins to stir up generosity in them? Oh, maybe I need to pay for someone else. I believe that the building fund has been stirring up generosity as we've been seeing it grow over this last month. There's been other people going, well, if they're doing it, well, then I'm going to do it as well. Come on, please, let me get up next week again. (laughs) So he's saying we can actually stir up one another with our enthusiasm for generosity. Verse 5, Paul writes, So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Here it is. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Let's let's stop here for a moment. Because Paul is being so upfront here. And I, I love it. He's saying, hey, this gift, it is a willing gift. I'm calling you out to a place of generosity, but I'm not about to manipulate you, and I'm not going to coerce you into giving. It still has to be a free will gift. And then later he throws out this wonderful biblical concept that's found throughout the scriptures of sowing and reaping, which we'll get to a little bit later on. But then he drops this bomb. God loves a cheerful giver. And if you know your Bible you know he's quoting the Greek version of Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8. And even if you did know your Bible, you may not have realized that he was quoting the Greek version of Proverbs chapter 22, verse 8. We're saying God loves a cheerful giver. Can I tell you that when you get a revelation of what God has done for you, and you get a revelation of his generosity, then you'll be able to team up with this beautiful biblical concept of being a cheerful giver and understanding this principle that I want to read you in Acts 20 verse 35. It says, in all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus said himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. As your pastor, listen to me, if you're giving your tithes and your offerings and you're giving it like this, <laughs> I don't really want to do it. <laughs> Can I, hear me, hear me, don't give. I don't want it, and neither does God. Why? Because God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. And if you feel like you're giving, but <laughs> I I feel manipulated into giving because they keep putting the building fund thing up there. I I feel manipulated. Can I respectfully and with absolute love tell you, hey, you ain't going to hear many pastors say this. Don't give. Don't give. Don't give. Why? Because giving is about more than just financing the kingdom, seeing people get saved, helping the poor. That's amazing. But you know what it comes down to? The generosity of our heart. It comes down to God gets our heart. And I love how unmanipulative Paul here is here. He says, hey, don't give against your will. That's why we say in our church when we do our offerings, sometimes we say we want to give out of conviction, not out of compulsion. Paul's like, yo, don't, I I want you to give. If I could be Paul today for our church, I want you to give, but I ain't going to manipulate you to get it. 
there's a need, there's scriptural mandate here to give, but I'm not going to manipulate you to do it. No one's going to know if you, that's why we don't know if you give or not. The banking system of the Philippines is so terrible that it works in our favor that we don't know who gives what. We don't know, so there's no manipulation or compulsion. But I want to challenge you, if you're going to give, oh, give happy, give cheerfully, because you'll begin to live in this principle that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if you haven't learned that yet, wait till you have children and wait till it's Christmas. As long as you're a nice parent. Right? I used to love getting gifts as a kid. I still like getting gifts. It's really nice. I really appreciate it. But do you know the joy that comes on my face, the joy in my heart when I get to see my children get a gift? I love shoes. I love getting shoes. And, and I, just, I love shoes. I love shoes. Blessed are the feet. Right? I love, I love shoes. And, and, but do you know, you don't know how much joy I get when I get to give shoes to people. It's my spiritual love language, is giving shoes to people, right? I, now don't come up to me and, <laughs> pastor, love me, right? No, I, I love you from afar. And, uh, uh, but but I, I love giving shoes, I, that's my thing, I just, I love giving shoes. And the joy when, when I give shoes to people and they go, man, I love, they were, and I go, wow, they look, the joy I get, why? Because I've learned the principle, oh, I love receiving shoes, but to be honest, I love giving shoes even more because the joy I see on their face, it does something inside of me. So Paul, let's get back to him. Verse 8, after he's made sure that our heart is cheerful as we give, he goes on and he says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Come on. If you want that blessing in your life, say amen and claim that for your life now. As the scriptures say, they shall freely and they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I don't think you understand the promise of God here because you're all too quiet. Let me read it again. Okay, okay, okay. I know our church is growing. We got a lot of new people in our church. I, I got. I got to. I got to. I got. Let me. Let me explain to you the spiritual dimension of claiming a promise, right? So some people are like, "Oh, your church. The, the people they, they yell too much. They, they, they say amen too much. This is this is why they say amen. Do you know what amen means? You know what amen means? Literally, it means let it be." Okay, so I'm going to teach. I need you to work with me here. Okay, I'm the pastor. Work with me here. So when I read out a promise that you go, oh, wow, that's amazing. I'm speaking it over you. And when you put up your hand, when you say amen, when you say that's good, you know what you're saying? You're saying, God, that promise in the word that he's reading, let that be in my life. And God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely, give generously. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Maybe, some of, maybe the reason why some of you didn't say amen is because you just want to give it and you don't want the generosity. Because he's not saying he's just going to give it so you can sit on your butt and get fat and eat lechon and have everyone else serve you. What? God's going to provide and he's going to give more. Why? So there's more to share. He's going to produce this generosity inside of you. So, so let's go back to last week for a moment because sowing and reaping, it's a biblical kingdom concept. And I'm not talking about prosperity. Ugh, ugh, I'm not pro Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that God is going to give you money. Let's just cut that prosperity crap out, right? 
But I believe in prosperity. I believe that we should be prosperous as followers of Jesus. So God just ain't going to give you money because you're a Christian and you turn up to church. It's like, "Mm, here's my church passport. I get money. No. God is going to, as you, with wisdom from him, steward what you have well, God will increase what you have. Just like Paul said, not just for yourself, but so that you can share it with others around you. I've always prayed to God, God, would you make me a river, not a lake? Would you let finances and generosity not flow into me, but flow through me? I want to live by the words of Jesus in Matthew 10. Freely I've received, so freely I want to give. And so what is the result of our generosity? Well, Paul, let's continue reading in verse 11. Yes, You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Come on, say amen to that. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things are going to result from the ministry of giving. Ready? These are the two good things. Write them down. The needs of believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them, to all the believers, will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. When you begin to live in a space of generosity, two things are going to happen. You're going to meet people's needs around you, and they are going to give thanks to God. Isn't that beautiful? We can actually show people how wonderful God is by our generosity. And I love that Paul's so clear here that they will give thanks not for the people, but they'll give thanks to God. Our generosity will point people to God. What will kill your generosity is this, pride. Which leads me to my last point. Keep your heart pure and let God get all the glory. When we give We ain't doing it for ourselves. Oh, I've had people with the most disgusting spirits. I want to vomit, come up and and give checks to the church, ask to have dinner with me so they can sit down and tell me all the money that they want to give to the church. And listen, money's money, right? I don't care. But... The the spirit and pride in which they walk in, honestly, it feels like the rich people that Jesus is looking at. Look at how much I gave. Hey, pastor, look at how much. So when I when I ask for my seat to be saved up the front, you know, you know. And and I've had to hold myself back from vomiting. I nearly fell off the stage. I feel so sick from thinking of these stories. I'm telling you, I've had to hold myself back from vomiting over some of these stories. Just the pride that they want to receive the glory. Now listen, I'll get up here. I'll thank anyone that gives. Thank you so much for giving. I love you. But I'm talking about the spirit of pride that wants to be known. And, and, and you know what's crazy about it? Every single one of those people, that, especially within Favor Church, my personal experience, every single one of those people haven't actually given that much. But they think they have. You would have no idea idea who the biggest givers in our church are and can I tell you the biggest givers in our church give it very sheepishly very humbly and I love it I feel blessed by it they don't give it and demand a seat somewhere they don't give it and demand us to change the auditorium name at Shangri-La to their last name they they're not giving it at all. You, you would have no idea who the biggest give. You would, I promise you, you would have no idea who the biggest givers are in our church. And I love it. I love it. Why? Because they give out of a place of humility that God would get all the glory. They have pure spirits. They love Jesus and they have generous hearts. I love what Galatians 6 verse 7 says. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh will from from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows in the spirit 
will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. Can I tell you that generosity, it's not just about finance. Keep your heart pure, let God get all the glory, but it's not just about finance. Money is the quickest way to someone's heart, but generosity is about how we live. It's a lifestyle. I just want to give you a, a quick list of some of the generous things that people in our church have done for our church or for, for other people. Uh, we, we, have, we have Connect Ministries. We have our Connect, Connect Group, Favor Connect, that have provided multiple, I, I can't even pick one story here, multiple stories that have provided weeks of food, hand-delivered, homemade meals, grab delivery, weeks of food and weeks of care and weeks of love to people that have been in hospital, people that have had miscarriages, people that have gone through hard times, their connect group getting around and being generous. Isn't that amazing? We've had business owners in our church that have provided care packages for our CIW, a thousand women provided care packages for the rest of the year for all their sanitary needs out of their generosity. We've had people during the recent floods, people in our church open up their homes and their houses to people who had their houses flooded at a moment's notice, going out risking, braving the storm to open up their homes to be generous to that. We've got business owners in our church that put Favor Church on the biggest LED screen on Etsa, and we've had a ton of people come to church because they look up and they see church for imperfect people. I want to try out that place. Also, a train caught on fire and someone took a video of it and it went viral and in the background of the train on fire along Etza, it was church for imperfect people on a viral video going up there. We've had favor college students that graduate and then pay for someone's tuition for the next year that can't afford it. We've had people praying every Sunday for God to show them someone that they can be kind and generous to in secret. We have, we have like, we have deals going down in church that look so shady where people will give an envelope, go, go. right? And people slip an envelope. Who's this from? I cannot say. Right? We have, we have people, do you realize that we have people come to church and, and, and one of the things that's on their mind is, who am I going to generously bless today? God, show me in the crowd who I'm going to physically give money to. That, that just blows my mind. We've had cars given to people from other people. We've had facility upgrades in our redemption school, people buying air cons and paint and giving it all that. We've had people volunteering and being generous with their time and their resource through favor care, serving the communities at redemption and floodway, serving our prisoners, serving pastors from all over the country. We've had youth leaders that will spend hours driving and picking up kids and then paying for their snacks generously out of their own money so that they would come and they would feel community. Every person today that's come and served, they have been generous with their time. We've had people here since 5 a.m. getting this service ready. we got people looking after all our kids right now so you can enjoy this service. we got people filming right now so that those online, this is all done by volunteers generously giving up their time to serve others. We've had people give blood, generous with your blood to other people. We've had people give up generously their time to help college students study and to tutor them and to help them in their studies. We've had many businesses in our church give in-kind donations like chocolate and milk. Our church just got a whole bunch of paint from rain or shine. We don't promote any businesses, but shout out rain or shine basketball that just gave us a whole bunch of paint so we can paint our new facility in Shangri-La. It's amazing. So, and I could go on and on and on and on about the generosity. I got a text from one of our staff members that said that they were blown away because last Sunday they went to dinner 
and they paid for somebody else's dinner on another table. And then when they went to pay for their own, they were shocked because there was another person that paid for them. We got ninja generosity going all over Crown. People are, you know, you know what, what they used to do? They used to eat and run, not pay for the bill, right? You know, what is eat and dash, whatever it is. Like, you eat and run and you don't pay for the bill. In our church, we pay and run. You don't even know who is generous. I remember the first time that someone in our church paid for me. Oh, Kate and I, you, whatever you want your church to be, the pastors, you have to be it. Whatever, business owner, whatever you want your business to be, you need to be it. Business owners, you want your people to show up on time, get there five minutes early. Business owners, you want your, your workers to work hard, you work hard, right? So we want, so Kate and I, just, we've just decided we're going to be generous no matter what. Every time we eat, we're going to be generous. You have to fight us to pay. We will fight you. I have physically accosted people before and pushed them out of the way so that I can fight. I'll never forget it. One of our guys who, who has been with us since the very beginning, one time Kate and I went out on a double date for dinner. And, you know, we preach it, but you just got to lead by example. And at the end of the night, I, I went up to, to pay. And the, the person goes, oh, sorry, sir, it's already been paid for. And I went, what? And I look, and the guy's like this. I went, you sneaky little rat. I said, how did you even get that? He goes, well, Pastor James, you taught me. I, I'd forgotten this. He goes, you taught me that when you walk in the restaurant, slide your credit card over so that the other person doesn't even have a chance to pay. And it was the first time that I received, and I'm telling you, that was one of the best meals I'd ever had. The food, eh, it was okay. It was, it was actually not, not that nice. But do you know how blessed I felt that someone in our church was getting this concept of generosity. And it just begins to spread. Generosity, it spreads like an infection. When you receive generosity, all of a sudden it just begins to, oh, oh, I need to do something now. I, I, I need to be generous. When you've received it, oh, man, I, I, I need to do something with it. Here, here's what's incredible, right? We've all received the greatest generosity that could ever have been given. And you know what it simply is? It's God giving us Jesus. It's the most generous thing we could ever have received. Is Jesus giving his life for us. Paying a price that we could not pay. We deserve, we deserve death because of our sin. Our sin leads us to death. And Jesus pays that price that we cannot pay. What a je if, if you want to get a picture of the generosity of God, look no further than God hanging on a cross. He didn't just give his leg for us. All right, I'll chop off my leg. I'll give that for you, right? 2,000 years later, we're all eating, you know, like leg-shaped communion. God, God didn't give his leg. He, he gave his body. Yes, he was God, but can I tell you, as much as he was 100% God, he was also 100% human. And every single whip he felt, every single punch he felt, every single abusive and curse word he felt, he took upon himself. But he did it because he loved you and I so much. How can I freely receive the gift of eternal life and so easily turn my back on the need of my brother? Could I put it to you that if you struggle to be generous with your brother, maybe you haven't fully embraced the free gift of eternal life. Because when you get it, when you understand how kind Jesus is, 
when you understand that God wants everyone to know him, that he hasn't pre-selected just a few people to know him, that he wants everybody, when you understand just how generous God is, that he so loved the world, not a few predestined people, but he loved the world that he gave Jesus. When we understand that generosity, oh, it's so easy to give to my brother. It's so easy to sow into the building fund for the decades and the generations to come. It's so easy to give into legacy offering for what we're, it's, it just becomes easier. It does. But it goes back to this. Do I know Jesus? Am I following Jesus? Have I received his gift of eternal life? Because sin stands between us and God. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, he broke the power of sin. That if we would come and believe in him, confess with our mouths, that we would be saved as we begin to follow him. You don't need to be perfect. You just need to be humble enough to follow Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to pray for everybody that we would be generous. Who here wants, who here wants generosity to rise up in your heart? Amen. Another question. Who here wants to be a target of generosity so that you can have so much that it overflows that you can share it around you? Come on, who, who, someone say amen to that. Let it be. I'm claiming that. Let it be in my life. Let it be, right? So, so I'm going to pray for all that. But before we do, I got to give you a chance that if you're not following Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I have to give you an opportunity to respond to him today. Maybe you've never done this before. Or maybe you did this a long time ago. Jesus loves you. Maybe you're watching online or listening to the sound of my voice. Jesus loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He's already proven his love for you. He's just waiting for you to accept what he's already done. Could we all just bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment? You're saying, James, that's me. I'm that first person. I've never done this before. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person. I did this a long time ago. But I walked away. I, I stopped following Jesus. Whatever your journey is, whatever your story is, that's okay. You're here right now. That's what matters. If that's you... You're saying, I, I want to begin to follow Jesus today. I want to ask him to forgive me of my sins. When I count to three, I want you to lift your hand nice and high because I want to pray for you right where you sit. If you're watching online, listening, you do the same thing in your room. God sees it. That's what matters. So come on, on the count of three, why don't you lift your hands? One, two, three, right now. Thank you. Hands here in the middle. Beautiful. Hands on the side, here. Hands up in the middle aisle. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you're watching, stick your hand up. God will see it. That's what matters. Wonderful. Hey, if you lifted your hand, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I see your hand up in the back as well. I see that hand up there. Put your hand on your heart. We're all going to pray a simple prayer together. I want us all to pray it, but if you lifted your hand, I really want you to mean these words with all your heart. Say this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. And I ask you to forgive my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross, for being generous with your life, for breaking the power of sin. And rising from the grave. Right now, Jesus, I ask you, please come into my life. I choose to follow you. I make you my Lord and Savior. Make me a new creation. Wash me clean. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Can you give God praise for every person that just prayed that prayer? You know, there was a few hands here, a few up in the aisle, a few over the side. Over to my right, Thea is over there, and she's holding up this little cardboard thing that says, raise your hand. At the end of the service, we're going to remind you about this. If you prayed that prayer, we would love to just have a quick conversation with you, maybe pray for you, explain the decision you've made. You know, the, the journey of following Jesus, it's not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done in community and with family, so we'd love to help you. Uh, just take the next steps in your decision to follow Jesus. We've got this beautiful lounge. Pastors and leaders are going to be waiting for you. Don't come alone. Bring your friend, your family member, whoever brought you, bring them with you. We'd love to connect with you only for a short couple of minutes, uh, and that would be wonderful. If you made that decision online, please click the link in whatever box, the description box of whatever platform you're watching on. Let us know that you made that decision, and we'd love to connect with you and try and help you on your journey as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you.